today, on this episode, we are going to deal with the Newton's laws of motion. So let's check. So let's deal with a force. So a force is a push or a pull exerted by one body and it has an effect to change the state of motion. The SI unit for uh, force is Newton, which is named after Sir Isaac Newton. So when we deal with force, it's anything that will cause us change in motion. So ito yung pwedeng magpagalaw or magpahinto ng kahit na anong bagay or kahit na ano na pwedeng gumalaw or tumingil. There are two general types of forces. We have fundamental and non-fundamental forces. So let's take a look into the fundamental forces. Fundamental forces are those are found or that can be uh, in a natural state. Meaning that without these forces, all other forces in nature will not be possible. So here, we have the gravity or the gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, the strong and the weak nuclear force. So that's a gravitational force. It is responsible for weights of the bodies on Earth. So this gravitational force on Earth itself gives us the uh, value of the weight. Later, I'll explain how this works. The next example is the electromagnetic force. This force holds atoms and molecules together. So meaning, if we wanted to come up with a compound, then we use or the molecules and atoms use this electromagnetic force to combine or to come up with compounds and solutions or mixtures. Then we have a strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force holds the constituents of the nucleus, which means that it binds together the neutrons and protons in the nucleus of an atom. That's why it's very hard for us or it's very difficult for a physical mean to extract protons and neutrons due to this strong nuclear force. While the last fundamental force is the weak nuclear force. The weak nuclear force plays a role on radioactive decay. So here, it is used for radioactive uh, activities or radioactivities that is needed to come up with fission and fusion which we will discuss in the latter part of general physics. Now, what is the non-fundamental force? So these non-fundamental forces are the forces that we often use. So we have pushing, pulling, and friction. These forces are common to us that we are able to use it every day and we experience it every day. So when you push, when you pull, and you experience a sudden stop due to friction, then that's called as a non-fundamental force. There are other types of forces as well. We can name these forces as contact and non-contact forces. The contact force is a result of the interaction of two objects that are physically in contact with each other, which means that they need to be placed together magkadikit, nagbidikit, or there is a certain portion of interaction between these two bodies. So if there are no interaction between the body, then there is no contact force that will happen. That is an example of a contact force. The first one is friction. So we denote friction as capital letter F with a subscript small letter f, which means that this is a frictional force. Another type of force which is in contact is the tension, which is happened in strings. And then we have normal force, which is Fn, which is uh, a force when an object is on top of anything and it interacts with the gravitational force or the equally opposite of 
the gravitational force. Later, we will try to explain more about normal forces. Another type of uh, contact force is the elastic force or Fe. It is the force that will tend to return an object to its original position. So for example, a rubber band, when we stretch it, there's a force that will pull it back to its original position, which is the elastic force. And then we have the applied force or the FAEP or the FA. This applied force is either pushing or pulling. For the non-contact forces, it is a result of the interaction of two objects that are not physically in contact with each other, meaning that there's a space between the two objects and it will be attracted with one another or the forces are acting on it. So concrete example for this non-contact force is the gravitational force where the core of the earth, which is the source of the gravity and an object, for example, this apple on this picture interact with one another by the gravitational force. Now, how are we going to uh, describe and analyze these forces? So we use a free body diagram. So in order for us to analyze the forces that is acting on a certain body, we use this diagram. A free body diagram is a diagram of forces acting on a body isolated from the rest of the system, which means that we are going to look into only the forces acting on a certain object and not all the forces that acting on it. We will uh, just look into a specific part of a certain object or a certain body and we isolate it so that we are able to uh, analyze all forces acting on this certain object. So how are we going to make this free body diagram? So the first one is to remember to choose the object that we will analyze. There are all objects around us. There are all forces around us, but we need to choose which one to analyze. Then we determine all forces acting on the body, not to include the forces that exerts on other objects. Example is this palayok. This palayok is hung for a game in our uh, Fiesta, popok palayok. So here, the palayok is not yet being broken. It's not being heat. So there are only two forces that acts on this object. The, the tension, which is from the rope or the string, and the force due to gravity or the gravitational force. We need to determine the direction in which the force is acting. So in this case, the force of gravity is pointing downward, and the tension is pointing upward, which means that the tensional force is on a positive and the gravitational force is on a negative, making the object stable. We're going to deal with this stability and equilibrium on the next discussions. But now, let's move on. Then we draw the force arrow from the object outward. So you will notice here that the tension is moving up from a point where it is uh, heightened and the, and the force due to gravity will always be uh, drawn from the center of gravity. So here, we draw the, the force of gravity on the middle part of the palayok and the string's tension pointing upward. Then we need to label them. In this case, we are able to analyze these forces. Another example, I have here a, a tin can for the game Tumbang Preso. So here, we notice that the Fn is drawn from the bottom up. Why? Because the normal force is a force interacting from a surface and a certain body. It is equally opposite. The value of Fn is equally opposite of the value of the Fg. Later, we're going to discuss how we're able to compute for the force due to gravity or the gravitational force. But at this time, let's watch this video clip from 
crash course physics. Newton's first law is all about inertia, which is basically an object's tendency to keep doing what it's doing. It's often stated as an object in motion will remain in motion and an object at rest will remain at rest unless acted upon by a force. Which is just another way of saying that to change the way something moves, to give it acceleration, you need a net force. So how do we measure inertia? Well, the most important thing to know is mass. Say you have two balls that are the same size, but one is an inflatable beach ball and the other is a bowling ball. The bowling ball is gonna be harder to move and harder to stop once it's moving. It has more inertia because it has more mass. Makes sense, right? More mass means more stuff with a tendency to keep doing what it was doing before your force came along and interrupted it. And this idea connects nicely to Newton's second law. Net force is equal to mass times acceleration. Or, as an equation, F net equals MA. It's important to remember that we're talking about net force here, the amount of force left over once you've added together all the forces that might cancel each other out. Let's say you have a hockey puck sitting on a perfectly frictionless ice rink, and I know they're not usually perfectly frictionless, but stick with it. If you're pushing the puck along with a stick, that's a force on it that isn't being cancelled out by anything else, so the puck is experiencing acceleration. But when the puck is just sitting still, or even when it's sliding across the ice after you've pushed it, then all the forces are balanced out. That's what's known as equilibrium. An object that's in equilibrium can still be moving, like the sliding puck, but its velocity won't be changing. It's when the forces get unbalanced that you start to see the exciting stuff happen. And probably the most common case of a net force making something move is the gravitational force. Say you throw a five kilogram ball straight up in the air and then, you know, get out of the way because that could really hurt if it hits you. But the force of gravity is pulling down on the ball, which is accelerating downward at a rate of 9.81 meters per second squared. So the net force is equal to ma, but the only force acting here is gravity. This means that if we could measure the acceleration of the ball, we'd be able to calculate the force of gravity. And we can measure the acceleration. It's 9.81 meters per second squared, the value we've been calling small g. So the force of gravity on the ball must be five kilograms, which is the mass of the ball, times small g, which comes to 49.05 kilograms times meters per second squared. We use this equation for gravity so much that it's often just written as fg equals mg. That's how you determine the force of gravity, otherwise known as weight. Now, those units can be a bit of a mouthful, so we just call them newtons. That's right, we measure weight in newtons in honor of Sir Isaac, and not in kilograms. Kilograms are a measure of mass, but gravity often isn't the only force acting on the object. So when we're trying to calculate a net force, we usually have to take into account more than just gravity. This is where we get into one of the forces that tends to show up a lot, which is explained by Newton's third law. You probably know this law as for every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction, which just means that if you exert a force on an object, it exerts an equal force back on you. And that's what we call the normal force. Normal in this instance means perpendicular. And the normal force is always perpendicular to whatever surface your object is resting on. At least it is when you're pushing on something big and macroscopic like a table. If you put a book down on a table, the normal force is pushing and therefore pointing up. But if you put it on a ramp, the normal force is pointing perpendicular to the ramp. Now, the normal force isn't like most other forces. It's special because it changes its magnitude. Say you have a piece of aluminium foil stretched tightly across the top of a bowl, and then you put one lonely grape on top of it. Because of gravity, that grape is exerting a little bit of force on the foil, and the normal force pushes right back with the same amount. But then you add another grape, which doubles the force on the foil. In that case, the normal force doubles too. That'll keep happening until eventually you add enough grapes that they break through the foil. That's what happens when the normal force can't match the force pushing against it. But what does Newton's famous third law really mean though? When I push on this desk with my finger right now, I'm applying a force to it, and it's applying an equal force right back on my finger, one that I can actually feel. But if that's true, and it is, then why are we able to move things? How can I pick up this mug? Or how can a reindeer pull a sleigh? Basically, things can move because there's more going on than just the action and reaction forces. For example, when a reindeer pulls on a sleigh, Newton's third law tells us that the sleigh is pulling back on it with an equal force. But the reindeer can still move the sleigh forward because it's standing on the ground. When it takes a step, it's pushing backward on the ground with its foot and the ground is pushing it forward. Meanwhile, the reindeer is also pulling on the sleigh while the sleigh is pulling right back. But the force from the ground pushing the reindeer forward is stronger than the force from the sleigh pulling it back. 
so the animal accelerates forward and so does the sleigh. So one takeaway here is that there would be no Christmas without physics. But now we have an idea of some of the forces we might encounter, let's describe what's happening when a box is sitting on the ground. The first thing to do, which is the first thing you should always do when you're solving a problem like this, is to draw what's known as a free body diagram. Basically, you draw a rough outline of the object, put a dot in the middle, and then draw and label arrows to represent all the forces. We also have to decide which direction is positive. In this case, we'll choose up to be positive. For our box, the free body diagram is pretty simple. There's an arrow pointing down, representing the force of gravity, and an arrow pointing up, representing the force of the ground pushing back on the box. Since the box is staying still, we know that it's not accelerating, which tells us that those forces are equal. So the net force is equal to zero. But what if you attach a rope to the top of the box, then connect it to the ceiling so the box is suspended in the air? Your net force is still zero because there's no acceleration on the box, and gravity is still pulling down in the same way it was before. But now the counteracting upward force comes from the rope acting on the box in what we call the tension force. To make our example simpler, we almost always assume that ropes have no mass and are completely unbreakable. No matter how much you pull on them, they'll pull right back, which means that the tension force isn't fixed. If the box weighs five newtons, then the tension in the rope is also five newtons. But if we add another five newtons of weight, the tension in the rope will become 10 newtons. Kind of like how the normal force changes with the grapes on the foil. But in this case, it's in response to a pulling force instead of a push. The key is that no matter what, you can add the forces together to give you a particular net force, even though that net force might not always be zero. Like in an elevator. So let's say you're in an elevator, or as I call them, a lift. The total mass of the lift, including you, is a thousand kilograms, and its movement is controlled by a counterweight attached to a pulley. The plan is to set up a counterweight of 850 kilograms and then let the lift go. Once you let go, the lift is going to start accelerating downward because it's heavier than the counterweight. And the hope is that the counterweight will keep it from accelerating too much. But how will we know if it's safe? How quickly is the lift going to accelerate downward? To find out, let's first draw a free body diagram for the lift, making up the positive direction. The force of gravity on the lift is pulling it down, and it's equal to the mass of the lift times small g. 9,810 newtons of force in the negative direction. And the force of tension is pulling the lift up in the positive direction, which means that for the lift, the net force is equal to the tension force minus the mass of the lift times small g. Now, since Newton's first law tells us that F net equals ma, we can set all of that to be equal to the lift's mass times some downward acceleration minus a. That's what we're trying to solve for. So let's do the same thing for the counterweight. Gravity is pulling it down with 8,338.5 newtons of force in the negative direction. And again, the force of tension is pulling it up so that the net force is equal to the tension force minus the mass of the counterweight times small g. And again, because of Newton's second law, we know that all of that is equal to the mass of the counterweight times that same acceleration a, which is positive this time since the counterweight is moving upwards. So putting all of that together, we end up with two equations and two unknowns. We don't have a value for the tension force and we don't have a value for acceleration. But what we're trying to solve for is the acceleration. So we use algebra to do that. When you have a system of equations like this, you can add or subtract all the terms on each side of the equal sign to turn them into one equation. For example, if you know that one plus two equals three, and that four plus two equals six, you can subtract the first equation from the second to get three equals three. And in our case with the lift, subtracting the first equation from the second gets rid of the term that represents the tension force. We now just have to solve for acceleration, meaning we need to rearrange the equation to set everything equal to a. We end up with an equation that really just says that a is equal to the difference between the weights, or the net force on the system, divided by the total mass. Essentially, this is just a fancier version of F net equals ma. And we can solve that for a, which turns out to be 0.795 meters per second squared, which is not that much acceleration at all. So as long as you aren't dropping too far down, you should be fine, even if the landing's a little bumpy. In this episode, you learned about Newton's three laws of motion, how inertia works, that net force is equal to mass times acceleration, how physicists define equilibrium, and all about the normal force and the tension force. Crash Course Physics is produced in association with PBS Digital Studios. You can head over to their channel to check out amazing shows like Braincraft, It's Okay to Be Smart, 
and PBS Idea Channel. This episode of Crash Course was filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney Crash Course Studio. With the help of these amazing people, and our graphics team is Thought Cafe. Thank you for that video clip from Crash Course Physics. So now we are going to discuss the three laws of motion set by Sir Isaac Newton. So what the first law is the law of inertia. It states to us that an object at rest tends to remain at rest and an object in constant motion tends to remain in constant motion along a straight line path unless acted upon by a net external force. So what does this mean for us? Ano ba ito sa atin? Let's have this example. You have here a vehicle that will be bumped to a wall. Sabi sa first law of motion, an object at rest will remain at rest. An object in motion will remain in constant motion along a straight line path unless acted upon by a net external force. So ibig sabihin, kung merong isang bagay na gumagalaw, ay mananatili itong gumagalaw, maliban na lang kung may mapapahinto dito. So in this example, in this uh, GIF here, in my top, on this presentation, the car is moving towards the wall. And you will notice as the car moves towards the wall, the passenger is moving along with it. So the moment that the passenger did not use his seat belt, the tendency is that it will topple over. So ang nangyayari, tatalsik siya once the car stop. Diba? So you notice that it's still moving on the same direction where the car is moving. Same thing when you ride the jeepney. When the jeepney suddenly stop, diba? huminto bigla yung jeepney, at hindi ka nakahawak sa handlebar, the tendency is that you will move towards the driver. Because the jeepney together with you, which is inside the jeep, is moving together on a certain direction. So kung bigla huminto yung jeep, ikaw ay mapupunta doon sa may malapit sa driver. So magsisiksikan ninyo yung mga tao na hindi nakahawak sa handlebar. That's why in a vehicle, it is much needed to have a seat belt in order for us to come up with a more safety uh, precautions. Walang bagay na magpapahinto sa mga bagay na magpapahinto. Inertia is the ability of an object to resist changes in the state of motion. Which means that this inertia is something to do with an object tends to keep doing what they are doing. So, ibig sabihin, this inertia is the ability of a certain object to resist its motion. Hindi niya ito pagagalawin. Meron siyang uh, sistema sa sarili niya na i-resist yung motion. Another example. So when this truck, which, is, which have a ladder on top of it, does not clump to the truck, so the tendency when the truck stops, diba, tumansik ulit yung, uh, ating, yung kanyang uh, ladder. Kasi nga, it is moving relative to the motion of the moving truck. Same direction. Moving to the second law of motion. The second law of motion is the law of acceleration. It states to us that the acceleration produced on the body by a force is directly proportional to the force and inversely proportional to its mass. Or it is simply in this equation. That the acceleration is directly proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the mass. So if we have a constant force and a greater mass, we have a lesser acceleration. To simplify this, we will come up with F is equal to MA. That a greater force and a faster acceleration, uh, sorry, a greater mass and a faster acceleration 
then we have a greater force exerted on a certain body. Let's have this. A force that is placed on this brick. This is an example came from uh, a certain book. It's just conceptual physics. We have here a force on hand accelerates the brick. So with the same amount of force, you will notice that when we add another brick, so the mass has been doubled, we have noticed that the acceleration decreases. With the same amount of force, again, you notice that when we add another brick, so the mass has been tripled or the brick, then you have a much lesser acceleration. On this case of an elephant, let's say that the greater mass, the greater the mass, the greater the force must be exerted for this given acceleration. Let's have an example. A four kilogram watermelon is pushed across the table. If the acceleration of the watermelon is 2.4 meters per second squared to the left, what is the net external force of the watermelon? Let's try to answer. So here we have a given, sorry. So here we have a given mass, which is equal to four kilograms, and then an acceleration equal to 2.4 meters per second squared. Then we are required to find the force. So our equation is force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. So for our solution, we have the force is equal to MA, force is equal to 4 kilograms times 2.4 meters per second squared. So our force is equal now to 9.6 kilograms meter per second squared. Let us take note that one kilogram newton meter squared is equal to one newton. That the unit for force is named after Sir Isaac Newton. So our force now is equal to 9.6 newtons. Next example, Amelia, the ballet dancer, has a mass of 45.0 kilograms. What is Amelia's weight on Earth? Let it be, what is Amelia's mass on Jupiter, where acceleration due to gravity is 25 meters per second squared? And what is Amelia's weight? So here, we have given mass of Amelia, which is 45.0 kilograms. And then we have the acceleration due to gravity on Earth, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. And then it's stated that the acceleration due to gravity on Jupiter is 25.0 meters per second squared. So we are required to find the following, letter A, the weight on Earth, letter B, the mass on Earth, and letter C, the weight on Jupiter. So our equation is that F is equal to MA. So before that, Let's try to look into this. So we have here, let's take note that the mass is the amount of matter in an object and the weight is the gravitational force acting on an object. So the mass is different to the weight. The mass has a unit of kilograms while the weight as a force is a unit of newtons. So here we can change F into FW or W and A into G. Let's take note that this weight is equal to the mass times the acceleration due to 
gravity. So we should not interchange the mass and the weight. Going back to our example number two from the problem solving exercises in physics or conceptual physics, we have Amelia, the ballet dancer, and we want to identify his weight on Earth, the mass on Jupiter, and the acceleration due to gravity on uh, the weight of Alicia on Jupiter. So going back, we have here our solution now. So for the first one, we have WE is equal to the mass and the acceleration due to gravity on Earth. So this is the weight on Earth. So the weight on Earth of Amelia is equal now to 45.0 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. So the weight on Earth of Amelia is equal to 441 meters. Let's take note. The next question is, what is Amelia's mass? So the mass doesn't change wherever you go. The mass will always be there. So here, the mass on Jupiter is still equal to 45.0 kilograms. So here, let us see what is the weight of Amelia on Jupiter. So we have her mass, which is 45.0 kilograms, and the acceleration due to gravity on Mars, uh, sorry, on Jupiter, which is 25 meters per second. And so the weight of Amelia on Jupiter is 1,130 newtons. So you notice that as the acceleration due to gravity increases, so the weight also increases. So mas mabigat ngayon yung inyong pakiramdam. When we go to the moon, which is one-sixth of the acceleration due to gravity on the Earth, mas magaang naman ang ating pakiramdam. So we can lift a boulders there because of the weight or the gravitational pull acting on the moon. Let's have example number three. A 30 gram arrow is shot by William Hell through an 88 centimeter thick apple sitting on top of his son's head. If the arrow enters the apple at 30 meters per second and emerges at 25 meters per second in the same direction, what is the force as the apple resisted the arrow? In this case, we are able to uh, look into that this is an example of the third law and the second law. I will discuss third law later. So let's continue this. So we are given that the mass is equal to 30 grams. Again, we now have the distance is equal to 8 centimeters. So the mass is equal to 0 0.0300 kilogram. In our uh, distance is 0 0.0800 meter. Let's take note the unit of mass is in kilograms and the unit of distance is in meter. So we have an initial velocity equal to 30 meters per second. And the final velocity is 25 meters per second. So here, we need to identify first the following and able for us to uh, calculate for the force since A is not present. So we need to identify A and F. So for this, we need to use the following equations. B squared is equal to B sub 0 squared plus 2AB. And F is equal to M A. So for our solution, we have 
b squared, this is equal to b sub zero squared, it's full a b. And we write this one equal to this. We move b, b sub zero to the other side, and we divide both sides by two b, isolate a. So this cancels. So we now have a is equal to b squared minus b sub zero squared divided by two b. So our acceleration now is equal to 25 squared minus 30 squared. So our acceleration now is equal to negative 1718.75. Meters per second squared. So this is what we are going to use to identify the force. Let's take note that the negative sign implies that the apple has causing the arrow to slow down. So here we now have F is equal to okay, M A. So we now have F is equal to 0 0.030. Times negative one seven one eight point seventy five. So the force now is equal okay. Okay. to negative five one point six newtons. Let's take note that the negative sign is due to the direction, which is opposite to the arrow's direction of motion. So, which means that it's the uh, interaction between the two objects. So the arrow is pointing on the, for example, to the right, where the force yeah. is moving to the left. And the acceleration causes the, uh, the apple causes the arrow to slow down. That's why we have a negative sign. So these are the examples for the Newton's laws for the second law of motion. So let's move on now to the next the law of motion, which is the law of interaction. It's just simple. Based on the, our uh, example number two, uh, example number three, sorry, in uh, Newton's laws of motion, in the second law, we have there that the apple slows down the arrow here. And the direction of the force is negative 51.6, meaning that it is the force acted by the apple to the arrow. So it's the same force that the arrow exerted to the apple. Why? In the third law of motion, it clearly states to us that for every action, there is an equal but opposite reaction. When we say equal, the magnitude of a certain force is equal in value but the direction is opposite. So in this example in number three for the second law, we have there that the action is opposite because the direction of the force exerted by the apple to the arrow is moving to the left, while the force acted by the arrow to the apple is going to the right. So both of them have the same magnitude of the force, but they have different uh, di directions. Another, so here, when we lean against the wall, we exert a force on the wall, and the wall clearly uh, pushes us back. So the wall uh, simultaneously exerts an equal and opposite force on us. That's why we are not able to topple over. Another example is that when we hammer a nail, so the interaction between the hammer and the nail is that each ex uh, exert the same amount of force, but different in direction. That's why you will notice that the hammer bounces back when you smash it on the nail. Another concrete example is the tug of war. So in order for you to just win, you should know the physics trick here. You need to push the floor so that the floor pushes you back. And then you need to grab a great 
and extend a great effort on the strain so that your tension must much be uh, greater compared to your opponent. And this is called as the action and reaction pair. So let's have this example, another. The action is the tire pushes on the road. So the reaction is that the road pushes on the tire. That's why the car is moving forward. Another action reaction is that the rocket pushes on gas. And then the reaction is that the gas pushes on the rocket. Another is that the, mal, the man is uh, pushing or pulling the string and then the string pulls on the man. And another is that the earth pulls on the ball and the ball pulls on the earth. All these examples came from conceptual physics made by Paul Hewitt. So let's see each other on the next uh, slides in a bit moment. We will talk about more about Newton's laws when we talk about friction. See you. So we move along now with our discussion with friction. It's part of one of the forces, uh, examples of forces in nature and how this friction um, interrelates with the Newton's laws of motion. So a friction is a force that tends to oppose motion. So in the, in the first law, we have there that a, a body at rest will remain at rest, diba? and the body in motion will uh, tends to remain in motion along a straight line path unless acted upon by a net external force. So there is a something that will make an object uh, stop moving, and that is uh, the friction. So in the previous examples that we have, we always assume that a body is in a frictionless uh, environment. Sabihin walang opposing forces acting on the object. Another uh, description of friction is that it is produced by interlocking of bumps and irregularities on the surfaces of a sliding object, which is created by the attraction between the atomic or molecular particles of two surface in contact. That's why friction is in the category of contact forces. So here, uh, microscopically, these forces or this type of force is due to the interlocking of the surfaces microscop uh, microscopically. Uh, the molecules are interacting with one another. And then uh, there are three types of friction. We have sliding, rolling, and viscous or fluid. So let's take note that rolling friction is less than the sliding friction because the surface that interacts here are lesser compared to the sliding friction. And that the sliding friction has two classifications. We have kinetic and static friction, which are be uh, able to discuss later. Then let's take note that kinetic friction or that the sliding friction has the resistance force between two surfaces already in motion, while the static friction is that it is present if the object is at rest. The rolling friction, in this case, this is a resistance force between a surface and a rolling object. While the fluid or the viscous friction, is it, it is a resistance force of gas or a liquid as an object passes through. An example of this is the air resistance or the fluid friction. There are some properties of friction. We have friction is parallel to the contact surface. It is never perpendicular. If it's perpendicular to the surface, therefore there's no friction at all. The direction is always opposite to the direction of the motion. So since it's opposing, it is always on the uh, different uh, direction. The magnitude depends on the surface or on the nature of the material and the condition of the surface of in contact. If it's smooth, then we have a lesser friction. And if it's rough, then we have a greater friction. That's why we use lubricants to uh, lower the frictional force that the certain object can 
have uh, during their interaction. And it is directly proportional to the upward uh, force of the surface in contact too. Based on this uh, description as a property of uh, friction, we can calculate frictional force through this, that the frictional force is equal to the coefficient of friction multiplied to the normal force. Since the property stated that it is directly proportional to the upward force of the surface in contact too. So meaning that is the normal force. If an object is sitting on a horizontal surface, the normal force is equal to the weight of the object. So that this, this is the discussion that we had last time or a while ago, that the normal force is equally opposite of the gravitational force. And then the, the symbol mu or the Greek letter mu is called as the coefficient of sliding friction or coefficient of friction. The higher coefficient of friction, in other words, a large number of it, means that the object is not likely to slide easily, while a low coefficient of friction is found between a very slippery surface. So the greater your uh, coefficient, the lesser movement that you have uh, for your uh, objects in, uh, in contact. Because the coefficient of friction is simply a ratio of force and the of the force of sliding friction to the normal force, it has no units. So later we will try to uh, have examples for frictional forces. So these frictional forces, as I said a while ago, we have two, the static friction and kinetic friction. The static friction, so mu s and mu k, mu s for static, mu k for kinetic. Mu s, we use it if an object is not moving. Friction is still present if an object is still at rest. And friction is present in, a, in an object or in, in a body that is moving, then we use mu sub k. Here are the different coefficients of friction between common materials. So we have leather sole shoe on carpet, on wood, a rubber sole shoe on wood, an auto tire on dry concrete, and a wet concrete, and an icy concrete. We have a rubber on asphalt, wood on wood, steel on steel, glass on glass, aluminum on steel, copper on glass. So you will notice that mu sub s, or this, the kinetic, the coefficient of static friction is much greater since it is not moving, while the kinetic or the coefficient of kinetic friction is much lesser because it's already uh, on a state of motion. So you will notice that as the surface move or goes uh, on a smoother surface or goes smoother, then you will come up with a lesser coefficient of friction, meaning that the uh, motion will be uh, go on and go on. So let's have this example, again, coming from the problem solving exercises in physics for conceptual physics. Example number four, Brian is walking through the school cafeteria but does not realize that the person in front of him has just spilled his glass of chocolate milk. As Brian, who weighs 420 newtons, steps on the milk, the coefficient of kinetic friction between Brian and the floor is suddenly reduced to 0 0.040. What is the force of sliding friction between Brian and the slippery floor? So let's have uh, answer this one. So we are here, we have a given. the Fg is equal to 420 newtons since Fg is equal opposite of the Fn. So this is equal to Fn positive 420 newtons. 
then we have the coefficient of kinetic friction is equal to 0 0.040. And here we are required to find the frictional force. Our equation, the frictional force is equal to, since it's moving, mu k, f n, or f n mu k. Then our solution. So we have FF is equal to 420 newtons times 0 0.040. So our frictional force or the force that uh, experienced by Brian or the sliding friction that has been experienced by Brian as he steps on the milk is 16.8 newtons. So this is the force that he uh, experienced. So let's have the next example. Example number five, still from the same book. So while decorating her apartment, Kitty slowly pushes an 82 kilogram cabinet across the wooden dining room, which resists the motion with a force of friction equal to 320 newtons. What is the coefficient of kinetic friction between the cabinet and the floor? So here, the, only, the given instead of a force is the mass of the cabinet, which is 82 kilograms. And then we have the frictional force experience which is 320 newtons. And then we have, since it's a frictional force, it is negative. And then we have the acceleration due to gravity so that we are able to calculate for the weight. So we are required to find the coefficient of kinetic friction. So to identify this, we have F, F is equal to mu K F N. So for our solution, we need to look into first F N. So we now have F N is equal opposite of Fg. So Fg is equal to Mg. So we have Fn now is equal to we have 82 kilograms times negative 9.8. So we have meters per second squared. So our weight then the Fn now is equal to since it's an opposite, Fn now here is equal to 803.6 newtons. So this is what we are going to use. So we have Ff is equal to mu k Fn. So we need to identify mu k. So we isolate it by dividing both sides by Fn. So this cancels out. So we now have mu k is equal to the frictional force. So mu k, sorry, it's big. So mu k is equal to. Our frictional force is 320 newtons. 320 newtons. So we have 320 newtons. And then our Fn is 803.6 newtons. So the coefficient is equal to 0.40. Let's take note that this is a ratio. That's why we don't have a unit for the coefficient of friction. So moving to our example number six. At 
SeaWorld, a 900-kilogram polar bear slides down a wet slide inclined at an angle of 25 degrees to the horizontal. The coefficient of friction between the bear and the slide is 0 0.0500. What is the frictional force impending the bear's motion down the slide? In this case, we need to look into our given. So we have the mass of the polar bear, which is 900 kilograms. We have an angle relative to the horizontal at 25.0 degrees and coefficient of kinetic friction of 0 0.0500. And we are required to find the frictional force. So still our equation is FF nu K F N. But let us take note that the weight is not uh, given, the FG. So let us take note that this bear is on the horizontal. So we have here this degree equal to 25 degrees. So if the bear is on this position, let's take note that this is its FG. And as stated in our first video clip from uh, physics, crash course physics, that the Fn is always perpendicular to the surface. So it, it is your Fn here. So we want to identify what will be the value of our Fn. So here, need to uh, use the trigonometric identity. So we now have here Fn is equal to Fg equal to mg cosine theta. Since we are going to uh, draw this on a bigger triangle, we will notice that the uh, fg, or our mg here, fg here, rather is our uh, adjacent side. So we have now equal to, so this is now fg. The mass is equal to 900 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times cosine 25. So giving us Fn, which is equal to Fg, equal to 7,993.63 newtons. So this value will be used in our frictional force. So we now have this 7993.63 newtons times our kinetic friction uh, coefficient of kinetic friction 0 0.0500. So when we multiply that, our final answer will be 399.68 newtons or roughly equal to 400 newtons. There we go. So let us notice that if we have this kind of given angle, we need to use a trigonometric identity to identify what will be the value of our uh, Fg or the force due to gravity. So before we end this video, this discussion that we have, let us uh, watch again another video clip, which is about friction from crash course physics. You may uh, go to the link that's posted on this video clip. You're moving into a new house and you ask a friend to come help out, which he does because he's just nice like that. And you really do need his help because you have to move giant bookcases and a desk and you can't do all of that on your own. And about halfway through the move-in, you're rearranging the furniture in your new bedroom when you run into a problem. You're pushing and pushing on your bookcase, but it's just not sliding across the floor. So you call your friend over from the other room, and with both of you pushing, the bookcase finally starts to slide. But it was really hard to get it moving and stay moving, because there's a force working against you, stopping the bookcase from sliding. 
friction. And there are actually two kinds of friction. First, there's kinetic friction. That's the force that slows the bookcase down as it slides. And then there's also static friction, the force that you had to overcome to get it moving in the first place. So let's talk about kinetic friction first. It's a resistive force, which just means that no matter what, it'll act to resist you. In other words, if you push the bookcase so it slides to the left, then the force of kinetic friction is acting to the right. But if you move the bookcase to the right, then the friction will resist to the left. Kinetic friction will also often and generate heat or sound or both. So what causes it? The bookcase and the wood floor might look smooth, but if you looked at their surfaces under a microscope, you'd see that they're covered in tiny bumps and grooves. As the bookcase slides across the floor, the surfaces catch on each other and might even start to form weak intermolecular bonds. That pulls on the bookcase, slowing it down. But as the bookcase continues to slide, it breaks those bonds and moves past whatever bumps it was stuck on. The newly freed molecules start to spring back and the movement produces heat and sound. Then the cycle continues with the next patch of floor. You end up with a force that resists any kind of sliding movement and its strength depends partly on what materials are sliding against each other. Rougher materials have more surfaces to catch on each other, which is why the bookcase will be easier to slide on the wood floor than if you tried it on carpet. And the way in which this roughness affects kinetic friction is called the coefficient of kinetic friction. And it's different for pretty much every combination of materials. But there's another factor at work in friction. How hard the materials are pressed together puts more of their surfaces in contact with each other. And that's where the normal force, or Fn, comes in. You might remember from our last episode that when a force pushes on a bookcase against the floor, the floor pushes right back. That's Newton's third law, and we call the force from the floor on the bookcase the normal force. In this case, the force from the bookcase on the floor is just its weight, mg. So the normal force would be equal to mg, but pointing up, equal and opposite. So now we know about the two main factors that affect the strength of kinetic friction. The coefficient of kinetic friction, written as muk, and the normal force, Fn. It shouldn't be too surprising then that the equation for kinetic friction is just the coefficient times the normal force. But that's only half the picture. What about static friction? When you weren't able to move the bookcase to begin with, that was because of the static friction between the bookcase and the floor. Like kinetic friction, it's also a resistive force. But not only can its direction change, its strength can change too. Say you push on the bookcase lightly with just one hand and it doesn't move. Since it doesn't have any acceleration, the bookcase must be in equilibrium, meaning that the forces on it balance out. So the force from static friction must be exactly equal to the force from your hand, but in the opposite direction direction because of that equilibrium. It's not the same as the normal force and it has nothing to do with Newton's third law. But say you really put your back into it, pushing as hard as you can. The bookcase still doesn't move, so static friction must still be pushing back with the same amount of force you are. However, the static friction between two objects can change. Once your friend starts pushing too, the bookcase starts to slide because the force from your teamwork is greater than the maximum amount of static friction, which we write like this. And the relationship between the maximum static friction and the normal force is similar to the relationship between kinetic friction and the normal force. There's even a coefficient of static friction, which measures the roughness between any two objects. And we just write it as MUS. And the maximum force of static friction is just equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So now we know the equations for both kinds of friction and where they come from, which means we can use that information to figure out how to solve problems involving friction. Just like with other force-related problems, we start with a free body diagram. That helps sort out what's pushing where so we can get an overview of the situation. Next, we decide on some axis, where x and y, and which way is positive. That'll be useful when ramps come up, because if we want, we can just decide that x points down the ramp and y points straight into it. The next thing we'll need to do is separate vectors into components along our new x and y axis. Because strange things happen to the normal force when you have something like that bookcase sitting on a ramp. The normal force is pointing out of the ramp because it's perpendicular to the surface but it's not equal and opposite to the force of gravity, because that's pointing straight down. Instead, we'll have to use trigonometry to separate the force of gravity into two perpendicular components, one pointing down along the ramp and one pointing into it. Then the normal force will just be equal and opposite to the part of the gravitational force that's pointing into the ramp. So here's how to separate and diagram everything that's going on. The angle between the force of gravity and the component pointing into the ramp is called theta, and it's the same as the incline of the ramp. Those make two sides of a right angle triangle, and since the component pointing into the ramp is adjacent to the angle, we know that it's equal to mg times the cosine of that angle. 
and so is the normal force. The other component pointing alongside the ramp is opposite the angle. So again, using trigonometry, we know that it's equal to mg times the sine of the angle. So you've drawn your free body diagram, you've decided on axis, and separated the force of gravity into two useful components. Now we can finally set up our equations. That's where Newton's second law, F net equals ma, comes in handy. There'll actually be two of these, one for the x direction down the ramp, and one for the y direction into the ramp. So let's say you've got the bookcase where it needs to go, and you're ready to get something else out of the moving van. This time, a 40 kilogram box with a very fragile vase inside it. It's heavy, so let's say you put it down on the ramp leading from the back of the truck to the ground, which happens to be angled at 30 degrees, and then you walk away to get a drink of water. You also happen to know that the coefficient of static friction between the box and the ramp is 0.50. What is the box's acceleration? If it's zero, it'll stay put and your vase should be okay when you walk away from it. If not, that means the box will start sliding down the ramp and you may have a problem. The first thing we need to do is draw a free body diagram of this box. So the coordinate system will have x along the ramp with the positive side at the bottom and y perpendicular to the surface of the ramp with the positive side also towards the bottom. And we have a whole bunch of forces here. The normal force is pointing out of the ramp. There's also the force of static friction which right now is pointing up the ramp since it's resisting the part of the gravitational force pulling the box down. Down. Speaking of which, the force of gravity is pointing straight down, not along either of our axes. So we separate it into components, mg cos theta pointing into the ramp and mg sine theta pointing down along the ramp. Now we set up our net force equations along each axis. The box isn't going anywhere along the y-axis. Nothing's going to make it start rising above the surface of the ramp, right? So we know that all the forces acting along the y-axis should add up to zero since they're all balanced out. But the forces along the x-axis along the ramp are a different story. If the box has no acceleration, it's standing still or moving at a constant velocity. They'll also add up to zero. But if it does have acceleration oh, no. along the ramp, then the forces will add up to its mass times that acceleration. So to figure out if the box slides, all we need to do is find out if the part of the gravitational force pushing it down the ramp, mg sine theta, is greater than the maximum static friction resisting it. In other words, if down the ramp is the positive direction, is the net force positive or zero? The forces here are the gravitational force pushing the box down the ramp mg sine theta, and the maximum static friction. But we write the maximum static friction as negative because it's pointing in the negative direction on our x-axis, up the ramp. So adding them together, we get this equation. Multiplying together the different values that make up mg sine theta, we find that it's equal to 196.20 newtons. And the maximum static friction is just equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So plugging in the numbers, we find that it's 169.91 newtons, which means that the net force is 26.29 newtons. So yes, there's a net force pushing on the box down the ramp, and it's going to slide, which means I have some bad news for you about that vase. But so I hope that you have learned something for this video. And uh, this is Newton's loss of motion. And I hope that we are able to see each other. Thank you and goodbye.